And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to another episode of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. I'm your host, Damien Valentine, and I'm joined by Phil Rice and Hello. Tracy Harwood. Hello. <laughs> um, Ricky is still at his horror convention. Um, I'm sure he's enjoying the, the terrifying things he's seeing. Uh, I'm kind of glad I'm not there. Um, so this week, uh, we're going to be discussing Phil's pick, and you've chosen uh, something quite interesting, and I'm looking forward to talking about it. But uh, why don't you get us started and tell us about it? Sure. So this is a uh, a film made in Blender. Uh, I actually was really excited. I, I picked this very much with Ricky in mind because he he's a, um, a a huge admirer of the kind of world building that went on for Half Life Two in particular. So I'm sure when he gets a chance to see this, he'll he'll enjoy it very much. But it's made in Blender, and it's it's I don't know. It kind of comes off like a like a trailer. Hey there, it's Phil. So I'm here editing this episode, and, listening to uh, myself and ramble on and on, and realized I'd never mentioned the name this of the film a... or the filmmaker. Because, so I guess you know, what you I'm getting old. So the title of this film is Half-Life Overworld, and the filmmaker's name is Unknown Dino. Continuation of the Half-Life story. Uh, which there's been a lot of uh, valve has given people a lot of time and room to speculate about that because the mythical half-life three has been talked about for well over a decade and uh still has not uh you know made itself known now they've they've done other releases in the half-life world of course there's half-life alex uh which originally was released solely as a vr game and very, very well received. I think since then, there's been a version put out where it can be played without the VR. But uh, but that was more of, that would fall more, I think, in like a prequel category because it was actually filling in a gap uh, in, in the timeline that we already know about. Anyway, so this is an attempt to imagine some possibilities for uh, where, you know, where that story could be taken to its next level. I'm not going to retell the whole Half-Life story here or anything, because um, I think most most listeners are probably at least a little bit aware of it. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a exploration of that notion of the next chapter of that story. Um, visually, uh, quite stunning as. You know, when when something's done well in Blender, yeah, that's the result. is uh, It's it's quite amazing. I think one of the details that stood out to me most was there's some close-ups that happen on uh, one of the creatures, and the skin has a very wet appearance. Uh, that's not easy to achieve in other other platforms. Blender is really good at that kind of stuff. Um, and then some some interesting visual effects regarding a wormhole and kind of a fleet of ships. And there's a really interesting visual choice at near the end where there's an iconic character, uh, Mr. Breen, uh, I believe is his name. Is that right? Breen? Dr. Breen. Yeah. 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 yeah Dr. Breen. The, the, basically he's the kind of collaborator in chief for these aliens that have taken over and he's the human representative. If you, if you watched Battlestar Galactica, he's the Gaius Baltar president, right? During the occupation. Well, at the end of this video, he has been assimilated into uh, the, the, 
something related to the combine um very much it, it reminded me a little bit of of uh of the borg uh assimilations that were portrayed in some of the star trek movies uh very just this gruesome he's half machine half human like it's just and yet recognizable enough to where you you know who it is so um yeah i was i was very very impressed with it visually thought it was it, i don't know stuff like this is is, is when a world has been built out well, and this is true for for Tolkien, you know, the Lord of the whole world around the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, or the Star Wars universe, or even Star Trek to some degree, and here with Half Life, when someone is is it it invites us to build on that story or speculate about that story, and you know, one way of doing that would just be having conversations. Uh, I, I overhear my son having conversations like that about Elden Ring and things like that all the time about what if they did this or what if it went this way? It's it's just a really fun pastime related to video games. When you're not actually gaming, you can do that. And this this feels like that sort of exercise, but with the added benefit of, of you know, being able to visually present it. It's not perfect. Um. I feel like that the, as we've seen so many times over the years with visually strong pieces, uh, the music and sound aren't on the same level. Now, I think the composition, the musical composition, like the actual music as written is quite good. Uh, it's, it's not simple. Um, it's, it's harmonically interesting and challenging. But the, the the instrumentation used is very clearly um, an older generation of virtual orchestra. And it used to be that was top of the line. Maybe back when Half-Life was released, for example, you'd hear that and it'd be like, wow, that's impressive. But it kind of stands out a little bit as being prior generation and, and it takes some of the impact away. I think mainly because there was so much of an attempt to use brass you know, trumpets, trombones, that type of thing. And man, even in even in the top of the line stuff nowadays, virtual brass is like the that's like the holy grail. It's 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 really elusive to get that to sound well. And so on the older gen stuff, it really stands out as as okay, that's not real. That's not realistic sounding. So that's a little unfortunate, but you know, to some degree, when it's a I assume not for profit machinima like all of our stuff, you know, it's it's you work with what you got, you know. Um, but it's it's one of those where there's clearly a good composer at work here, uh, who just doesn't, you know, doesn't yet have the, by the way, very, very, very expensive uh tools to have, you know, the latest and greatest on the virtual instrumentation. So that's that's something that to me as a as a composer stood out a little bit that I noticed maybe most people wouldn't. And then sound wise, it just there was kind of a the sound was a little bit anemic, like it didn't have gravitas, you know, like fullness and the way that the vision it didn't match the level of intensity of the visuals at times. So these big things moving across the screen, and the sound is is more on the thin side. So um, you know, again, you work with what you got. Those are things that that kind of stood out to me because those are areas that I uh, maybe have a, you know, a little bit more skill in or that I at least prioritize. Um, but there's no denying visually it's, it's gorgeous and it's interesting. Um, there's not really a, a too specific narrative. You get the impression that the aliens are coming in larger force and stepping it up a bit which is an interesting thing dramatically um but they don't pin it down too specifically it's more of kind of painting ideas about what's what's going to happen and i like that i think that worked really well so uh what did you guys think yeah do uh, you want me to go damien you... yeah 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 all right um i just on your music point i thought i'd um picked up that he'd used music slowed down and reversed from the game the original game hmm. 
So I don't think he composed anything. I just think he tweaked with what was already there. But um, maybe he'll come back to us and just sort of tell us a little bit more about that because I think that's quite interesting if that's what he did. Um, relates to some of the comments that I've got on this as well, which, um, you know, let me, let me sort of start by saying basically uh, the first thing that I really appreciated um, in this was that Unknown Dino, who's the creator here, um, has given a lot of recognition to the subreddit um, community that um, he's part of for things like suggestions during the design process. So this, in effect, was a kind of a, a community, not, not created, but community in um, devised project, I think, um, which is which is a really interesting way to go about the creative process. Um, I was really intrigued by comments um uh you know um comments on the stated inspiration for it being a half life to art book called raising the bar um and i had a look at that book um and you can clearly see that some of the the designs and the and the way that they have been created in blender are connected to the book perhaps more than the game which I think is quite an interesting strategy for it. So it's it's kind of perhaps a little bit like a graphic novel in the way that it's been um, presented. Um, and then, of course, you can also see some kind of influences in the in the development of this um, films like Alien and Prometheus. But I, in some ways, I saw a little bit of War of the Worlds in here as well. Um, mm, in the way definitely things were moving a bit. I think there was a lot of craft in this. Um, it, you know, the, the, the creator was at point at, at pains to sort of say that everything had been um, created and designed by hand, including the concepts, the models, the textures, the rigs, the animations, with the exception only of um, uh, G-Man and Dr. Breen's face. Those are the only things. He also stated um, that no generative AI assets had been used in the project. Um even for the concept stage. And then he said, if that even matters to anyone. Now, I can appreciate that somebody might want to say that in the current context of the various kickbacks that we're seeing from creators using generative AI tools, um, that you might want to sort of say something like that. But I think there's something else worth saying here uh, in response to that specifically in relation to machinima and the way machinima has evolved and, and um, developed over the years, which is that machinima was always about cultural appropriation, um, using the games as tools to tell new or different stories, um, some inspired by the game, some nothing to do with the original game. Um, you know, it was, it was always about that idea of cultural appropriation. So even with recrafted assets, whether they're based on Valve's IP or, or not, um, you have to recognise that the same legal challenges to your endeavour will exist, whether you hand-drew them, whether you reused assets from the game, or whether you have used AI. And if it's about um, story and extending the narrative arc of the game, then you basically just do that the best way you can. You do not need to apologise for using game-inspired tools, game assets, and generative AI, AI in the process. So I think I would definitely sort of stand by that as a um, as a comment. And I don't think you need to spend years doing this sort of thing. I think you just crack on and do it. Now, as I said um, a, a few minutes ago, this for me has all the aesthetic of, a, of an animated graphic novel focused on this kind of world, rather than, as you said, Phil, rather than any kind of story arc um, because I didn't really see a, a story arc in it at all. Um, but it is actually more than um, a graphic novel. It's it's basically a deep homage to the the creatures, the music, and the characters um, in in the game. The creatures and their world are actually the most stunning cinematic flypaths in this. We don't really know what they're doing. Um, but that ambiguity is clearly part of the extended arc. Uh, and it's a it's a real temptation to think about 
what it is they might be doing. There, there are a kind of a couple of narrative in, uh, interventions which allude to the um, the plot, and actually, I think they're quite important in positioning the film beyond it being just another cinematic experience. Um, but they're not the only thing that's kind of going on in it. Um, I think it's actually beautifully edited together. The lighting and the aesthetic is really quite stunning. And I'm impressed that the game has inspired such a dedicated attempt to extend the world. And and, and he's created a new creature in it as well, which he, which he also states in the in the description. And again, you can you can see how he's come up with it using the art book idea. I'll put a link to the art book because it's, you know, you can see it online. Um, you know, so so I guess I guess really um I don't I don't I don't suppose I have too much criticism other than other than basically what I've just sort of been saying. I wonder if perhaps though the 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 maybe the um aesthetic for the combine might be too clean and colourful. I don't know. I always kind of expected this world to be post-apocalyptic, sort of, you know, filled with dirty, smelly creatures, because, you know, that's kind of how they come across. But they're not that in this. They're not in any way that at all. So that, I think, is an intriguing thing that I hadn't anticipated. And also that there's kind of that golden hue over the whole thing, which almost puts a, a rose tintedness on it. So it kind of almost juxtaposes the the horror of the of the nature of what you're looking at and, and kind of paints it, paints it being the optimum optimum term, if you like, in a in a in a kind of an interesting light. Um overall I think it's it's a really impressive piece of work. I think well done to all of those that are involved in it. Um I was especially taken by one comment that I saw, um, which I mentioned. Um, th this was a, and your reference to Tolkien was was also interesting in this context. This comment says, seeing the combined world being explored by fans, even conceptually, is something I've always wanted to see. I had a lot of thoughts on what it may look like myself, but this has to be the most accurate. Hmm. And... I th I thought that was a very interesting observation, and and to your comment about Tolkien, I can remember when I went to saw see the first Tolkien film, The Hobbit, how closely Peter Jackson had got how I had imagined it would look. Now, if that's what this creator has been able to do, say by invoking the the aesthetic style in that art book, then I think they've done an excellent job with it. So very well done to all of them. Those are my comments on it. Well, for me, I watched it, and of course, it's especially stunning, which is pretty obvious when you watch it. Um, and I was intrigued by the, you know, the creature that Breen had become. But the thing it got to me is, towards the end of it, it cuts to what looks like the game. So you got the, the interface pops up, and you got this first person perspective, and that made me think. So it's not just continuing after uh, where episode two leaves off, but it's kind of a, a way to prod Valve and say, look, this could be Half-Life 3. Uh, and so it kind of gave me a new way to look at it. And I started thinking, well, actually, if they did make Half-Life 3, it's going to have to look like this. Um, because obviously Half-Life 2 is not a new game and it's, it still holds up nicely, but it can't compete with the more modern uh, graphics engines which is that's not um, a bad thing it's just the nature of how video games evolve over time so it's kind of like prodding valve make this because we want it to look like this um mm. and it kind of gives that impression of the, the bit you see before the interface comes up is the introduction and then it cuts to the game and then from here the game would carry on and tell whatever story it would be um, and I think, you know, fans of the Half-Life games have been waiting a very long time to see what's going to happen next. And it's good that Valve do let fans explore that potential. Um, and this is obviously this fan's idea of what he thinks the direction should be. I, I did feel like the, the visuals did capture the tone of the Half-Life universe quite nicely uh very recognizable 
but newer because obviously graphics have evolved since then, as I just said. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, a taste of what the potential for Half Life Three is. Now I'm not going to speculate on when or if Half Life Three is going to happen because we'd be here all night. Uh, and bigger Half Life fans have that conversation all the time, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a good way to explore the potential there. I hope Valve do look at it and maybe they'll think, oh, maybe we should do something. Um, but I don't know what the rumors are. I don't really follow because, you know, half Valve do seem to have this. Mm. Uh, that they don't seem to be able to count to three because everything, all of their series, stop at two. Um, so you, know, I imagine there won't be a Steam Deck three either. There'll be a Steam Deck two, but there won't be a third one because <laughs> that's just Valve. Uh, but you know, I I hope this does uh, give them some inspiration. Um, but yeah, the film itself, it's really must be done. There's so much detail in the, in the visuals. And, you know, it's so easy just to put a few recognisable things and then, and then just leave the rest. But there's just so much background detail as well that you pause it and you can see interesting things to look at. It must have taken a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of the why the, for that comment about this was not used, uh, generative AI was not used for this because he wanted people to know that he had put that time in. He wasn't trying to apologize, you know, it's, uh, for AI. It's just saying, I, this is something I actually did. And he wanted people to know that he had done it. Uh, partly to show off his skill set, which mm -hmm. is considerable when you, you examine this video closely. Uh, so, I, I, you know, if you put that much work into it, I don't blame you. To blame him for wanting people to, you know, and realize that, you know, he he spent a long time on this, and it shows. Um, so yeah, I was very impressed by this, and I don't really know what else I can say about it. Uh, I feel like maybe I should watch it a, a couple of other times because I think, you know, I, I always like detail in films, but uh, the right amount you could you could put so much detail into a, a single frame that you're just completely overwhelmed by what you're seeing. You don't get a chance to absorb what's important or not because there's just so much everywhere but this gets it right it makes the world behind interesting but it's not so much that you don't know what to look at and you know this is this yeah it's very inspirational uh yeah the, yeah i really the, enjoyed it the ai disclaimer thing is it is interesting uh because there is a variety of reasons why one might do that like you've mm. both pointed out to in so many scenarios, it feels to me sometimes, not necessarily here, but sometimes just feels like that it's it's the digital creator's equivalent to pronouns in your email signature. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do. Where it really is yeah. just this is what we do now. This is this is <laughs> the stance that I want to make sure people know where I am on this issue. And so I just do it. <laughs> you know yeah. and so is the is it that is it as simple as that or is it you know is it is it like you know what what you the the view you had on Damien was interesting because it reminds me of uh okay so early 90s uh this was when the really the rise of industrial and electronic music was really really on the rise um, you know, bands like Nine Inch Nails and then members, of, a couple members of Nine Inch Nails formed a band called Filter, uh, Richard something or other. And basically right around that same time is when Tool released their first album, which has no electronics on it whatsoever. It's all the band. They've always been that way. Uh, and they made a point on the Undertow album to have a disclaimer in the liner notes saying no electronic instruments were used on this record of any kind. Everything you hear, very similar vibe yeah. to the way that you interpreted his AI mention on here. And then a year later, Filter released an album, which is all electronic except for maybe the guitars and vocals. And they had a thing on there saying, we use we used electronic instruments. They're, they're, a, they're a vital... You know, they're, they're a uh, valid, they're a valid way of making music and, and we're not ashamed of it. 
And like, that was a thing back then, right? With music. But it really is the same, yeah. same spectrum just now applied to the way AR, AI art is being, uh, as, as the community is wrestling with, how do we, how do we contend with this thing? Because like when Tool put that on their album, they knew electronic music wasn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. But and yet they really felt it important to make a stance. So was that them puffing themselves up and saying, hey, we played all of this with our hands. So, <laughs> you know, or or was it some some other reason to have the stance? And yeah, the same questions arise here. So, yeah, that that's all very interesting. The uh, as far as the evolution of you know, projecting where Half-Life's narrative is going to go, which I think the art book this is inspired on and this film uh, explore an avenue there. And then you're right, Damien, at the end, when they put it in the first person view, you actually see your hands and then the HUD comes up. And yeah, it's this sense of, okay, we've shown you this place now. And now imagine yourself there. So... Is this just doom? Here's why I say that. Or Starship Troopers for, for, for a simpler examine. It starts off, uh, doom, the narrative in doom, in a nutshell. A portal is opened on one of the, on Mars or on one of the moons of Mars, right? Yeah. And so your first thing is confronting what happens when this portal opens. Half-Life 1. Doom 2 he goes home to Earth and everything is taken over by these demonic entities. Yeah. Half-Life 2. And then at the end of Doom 2 and then subsequent Doom games, there's a lot of emphasis on, then you go to hell itself, to the source, to fight them at home. That's the plot of Starship Troopers. They came and got us and now we're going after them. It's the plot in Battlestar Galactica at some point where... At some point, we can't keep being on the defense here. We got to go after him. It's the plot of Half-Life, you know, or could be if it goes this way, that now we're, this is their home. This is the Combine homeworld. It's the first time it's ever been seen. It's never been seen in the games. We've seen other planets, but that was that slave race, right? The slave race of aliens that they also yeah. subjected to their rule. So yeah, is this just that? It's okay, the logical next step for this narrative is... They invaded through a portal. We contended with that. Then they took over the planet and we've contended to some degree with that. But now we need to go to where they came from to finally put them to a stop. It's kind of a classic, uh, trope. for lack of a better word, trope. Yeah, I was going to say cliche, but trope is better um, to, you know, if you want to put a stop at this, you got to stop it. You know, you got to fix the leak where it happened, you know? So yeah, that's, it is the next logical step, you know, you, you, Half-Life 3 can't just be, oh, now Earth is even worse. That's boring. Yeah. You know, they've they've done the Earth is ravaged by it. This is the next logical place to go. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty insightful on their part, I think. And I, I it wouldn't surprise me at all if Half-Life 3 ever does materialize. Um, if it isn't something where Gordon is, you know. Uh, you know, star hopping, you know, to go take them on where they are, go through the portal the other way to get them. So, yeah. Um, yeah, all interesting stuff. So thanks for your comments, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, Ricky, get with me privately when you when you see this. I'd love to hear what you think of this as well, because he's he and I have had countless conversations over the years about the, the world building of Half-Life 2. I think he'll mm. I think he'll really enjoy this. So I got a question for you now, Phil. After that Doom comparison, yeah. Earlier this uh, summer, they announced uh, I think it's called Doom Dark Ages or something. It's sort of set in the medieval times. So does that mean at some point in the future there's going to be a Half Life game set in the medieval <laughs> time period? Oh, I keep expecting Doc <laughs> to show up in the DeLorean. Oh no! You no, know, and say Marty. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's a weird it's a weird move it mm. looks like a neat aesthetic but i think okay so we can say a lot of things about id software uh they they've engine wise graphics wise optimization wise 
optimizing network packets so that live, you know, gameplay when they what they did with Quake changed the world hmm. of games. Narrative isn't their big thing. <laughs> Never has been. Characterization, the Doom guy. I mean, that's not their strength, right? Even uh, what was the other one they did? Rust, which is kind of like a Mad Max type setting of post-apocalypse and whatever. But, you know, there's no characterization going on. There's no, like, as, you know, Fallout 4 or Bethesda games as a comparison in Fallout, in Starfield, games like Mass Effect and Bioware and stuff that there's there's characters there's there's people that you relate to and stuff that's never been where it is strong never so to me it feels like the medieval jump is just you know what would look cool that's how yeah. that meeting started and ended is you know it would be cool so yeah i mean i i think it's it's attempt to, to an attempt to be fresh but they haven't really story didn't lead that conversation that's for sure so uh, definitely not no yeah. But I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun to play. I think I think I think the next one will be uh, you know, Doom Guy goes back and there's dinosaurs and demons. <laughs> In fact, that's the subtitle. I'm I'm gonna go get that domain name as soon oh, as we're done. Here. That's really dinosaurs and demons. Yeah. This yeah. guy's name is Unknown Dino. Yes. I didn't mention that when I introduced the film. I'm sorry. Unknown mm. Dino. Mm. Uh, but well, of course we'll have a link and an embed of the of the film. So well, there you go. We've given you the next set of plots for your um, next interpretations of four, five, and six. This thing has a million views, by the way. I know. It's amazing. And it was released two months ago. Yeah. Wow. A million views. Well, that just well, well shows done. you how impressive it is, well but also done. how popular Half-Life is as well still. Yeah. Well, it's an excellent choice, Phil. Uh, we've obviously all enjoyed it and enjoyed discussing it. Um, Ricky, I hope you enjoy it too when you watch it. Um, and I hope you're having a great time at the horror convention. Um, so we will see you all next week. Uh, yeah, next week. Um, if you've got any feedback, uh, if you want to talk about this film or Half Life or Doom, if you want to share your thoughts on the Doom Dark Ages or where the Doom could go in the future or where Half Life can go in the future, uh, please uh, email us at talk at completelymachinery.com. And we will see you again soon. Take care and bye. Bye.